Thank you, Brian, for the introduction. Um, I'm delighted to be here today. Uh, I can see it's a pretty packed house, so if you would like to come down to the front, there's a couple of extra seats left. Uh, before I begin, um, live long and prosper, next generation diagnosis of infection. Uh, as Brian pointed out correctly, I've benefited greatly from the environment where I work. Fantastic department. And one of the important things when you give a, a talk like this for CME is to provide some disclosures. And so I don't have any disclosures uh, about financial conflicts of interest. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share with you my version of how uh, we can help patients by diagnosing infections that can kill them. Um, but it is grand rounds, not grand speculation, and not grand illusion. So uh, I think that there are frontiers that are right before us right now coming into our clinical lab. And so that gives you a bit of a feeling for the orientation of my talk today. Um, I also have to disclose that I work with outstanding people. Um, MDs, PhDs, and MD-PhDs that are on the faculty here. Um, incredible staff that have graduated from our graduate programs, uh, both in this department and other departments, as well as uh, our MLS, or Medical Laboratory Scientist Training Program. And I think it's worth pointing out uh, that the majority of the faculty and the overwhelming majority of the staff that I work with are graduates of um, our programs. Uh, so the work I'm going to describe today has really been a team, um, multiple locations within UW Medicine, um, enumerating about 120 different individuals, and our innovations integrate across multiple disciplines, and uh, I can see all of them represented in the room today, um, save for maybe that back corner because this light is pretty bright. And I, I, I think my first take home message, unfortunately there won't be a question on this, um, is that if you want to have a robust and enduring Starfleet, it actually requires Starfleet Academy. And, and we have that in our department and so I'd like to begin by celebrating that. Um, our goals as a group were to support the best delivery of, of case, patient care possible by constantly improving our ability to diagnose infection and to power effective therapies and to provide great value and the best possible outcomes um, for our patients. So that's a little, a little uh, good to great. If you have good data, you can make good decisions. And obviously, if you have great data, you can make better decisions. And so before we launch into what I think are, pardon me, I stepped out of the box. Um, uh, I'm not supposed to step out of the box here while I speak, and that's, that's a, a challenge for me. So uh, apologies, UWTV and everyone in Zoom land and next week on YouTube. Okay. Um, before we get started, I'm, I'm going to provide you with a context for thinking about the new frontiers. And so if we're going to talk about infection, we need to talk about pathogen. And so the very first question is, what is a pathogen? And so one way to define a pathogen is, is it's a microbe endowed with the capacity to cause an infection. And we'll get to the phenotypic manifestation of the genome in a second. I really like to say those words, the phenotypic manifestation of the genome, because it encapsulates so much of my undergraduate career in, in biochemistry and molecular biology. But because microbes have the capacity to cause infection, there's a greater context here. And that context is important um, when you're thinking about diagnosing inf uh, infections. So the pathogen interacts with a host in order to cause infection. And here, here's my thesis that I would like you to consider, and uh, is that that interaction of a pathogen with a host, the outcome is determined essentially as a result of the net replication of that organism. Now. To dissect that a little further, I'd like to use some complex math called arithmetic, and that would be in this slide, where we can appreciate that microbial expansion or replication minus the death, 
that is associated with antimicrobial activity and otherwise antimicrobial resistance in a host provides you with net replication. I'm sure most of you are thinking, wow, I, I already thought of that, Brad. <laughs> um, but we will continue uh, because really those are broad terms and there are many contributions to antimicrobial resistance. And so for the proof of this concept, I'm going to give you two examples where we can precisely uh, extract contributions to this uh, equation that I'm defining for you that really allows us to think about the expanding frontiers for, for diagnosing infection. And so if we focus in uh, on one particular aspect of this equation, you can also think about it as the immunopathogenesis of infection. And what I w present to you is that pathogens have the capacity either to evade or inhibit or delay or redirect host processes that are antimicrobial. And as a result of that, would anyone like to tell me what happens to net replication? Correct answer, thumbs up. Net replication goes up and as a result, the pathogen en enjoys the following situation. Initial colonization, possibly colonization that is longer term and persistent and develops into a carrier state which provides pathogens with transmission advantages, infection, which we could define as a point in net replication when there's a measurable physiologic response in the host, indicating the presence of replicating microbes, and further on to disease, which is a state that I would propose to you really is about transmission of infectious agents to a new host for additional pieces of replication. Okay. So on the flip side, of course, we have primary and secondary defense functions, inflammation, and also a, a, a particular process that I would like to familiarize you with called pyrotosis, which is a form of cell death that leads to inflammation. And these are host process processes that increase microbial death, and therefore we would suspect would do what to net replication? Correct. Thumbs down. It's amazing how many more people were willing to go like this than that. Okay. Um, you must be microbiologically focused. You're rooting for the microbe. Okay. And the end result for the host in this case is clearance of the offending pathogen, survival, and in some wonderful cases, long-lived immunity, which is a great topic that we won't talk about today. So in this context, what I would say is that there's this co-evolutionary dynamic between the development of the capacity of pathogens to cause infection, i.e. their ability to raise their net replication rate, and that's ongoing no matter what we do, okay? We have great, great examples of this. Um, Staph aureus in our lifetime has changed. Uh, Neisseria meningitidis has changed. Um, cholera has changed over the time that we've been able to track that disease. <laughs> This will occur whether we do anything or not. One of the things we do impact, you, healthcare worker, me, healthcare worker, is we're part of a greater organization that is using modern medical therapies, and often we are now modulating the capacity of the immune system in order to get effective therapy. Okay, so we, we are altering this part of the equation, and as a result of that, this dynamic system leads to new opportunities for diagnosing infection. So, a little bit about pyrotosis. It's a host cell death process, roots pyro meaning fire and tosis meaning to fall from uh, a tree like a leaf. It's dependent on, upon an enzyme called caspase-1, it's a cysteine protease. It cleaves its targets, including pro-inflammatory cytokines, and it also leads to the death of this cell. It's very pro-inflammatory in nature. Um, what does it look like? This is what it looks like at a cellular level. Um, here we're using a reagent to label active caspase 1 green. If you look in the upper corner over here, you can see a cell. This is the nucleus of a macrophage. You can see some diffusely distributed cytoplasmic 
caspase 1 that is active, and then this intense focus uh, of caspase 1, which is pseudo-colored here. And of course, this is, this is a subcellular organelle that's also known as the inflammasome, or affectionately known by me as the smoking hot focus of active caspase 1. So this enzyme becomes activated upon its activation. The macrophage dies, but it also elicits inflammation. Okay, we're gonna to return to this concept in a bit. So now, my first example uh, of the interaction of the pathogen with the host uh, to help us think about new frontiers for diagnosis. And the first example, I mean, microbiologists love to put up their slides of life cycles, right? And then use polysyllabic words that not even microbiologists care about. So this is my over-engineered version of a life cycle of Yersinia pestis. Okay, a one microliter contribution from an infected rodent that's taken by a flea that hops onto you and bites you, and you're dead. Yersinia pestis, bubonic plague. Okay, what that requires of this pathogen is that it grows to incredibly high levels inside of that rat host before a one microliter blood meal can actually transmit bugs so that you get propagation of this infectious agent. And so there is a relationship between pyrotosis and bacterial replication for this organism. But first, some basics. A pro-inflammatory process that counters bacterial replication is good for the host. Um, that's not a question, that's a statement of fact. Okay, so when bacterial replication is sufficient that it be it's betrayed and tickles the process that results in pyrotosis, we have an inhibitory process. Pyrotosis blocks bacterial replication. And what happens to our net replication in this model? Correct. We get a reduction in bacterial replication. Host is saved. That's wonderful. Yersinia pestis, however, makes a particular inhibitor. So it's able to inhibit this activation process. And so that looks more like this. Yersinia is able to block this process. If you block a process that blocks you, the enemy of your enemy is your friend. This leads to increased bacterial replication. Okay, you're not interested in pathogenesis, but here's the story. Can we now ask the question, is that inhibitor essential for the growth of the microbe? in the context of the host? And the answer is, we can do a precise genetic experiment and test that question. So we alter the production of one molecule, the inhibitor molecule. When we do that, what occurs? Now the bacterium no longer blocks this host protective process and it is activated by the presence of the bacteria. So we can predict that what happens? Pyrotosis is activated. We get decrease in net bacterial replication. This provides a proof of concept that this molecule, the ability to avoid the host immune response is required for, for growth or infection. And now we can ask the question, is the, is the inhibition by this molecule actually blocking pyrotosis or is it something else? And so we do, again, using the power of genetics, we precisely eliminate the ability of this host to to activate pyrotosis, and we now infect it with this bacterium that no longer makes an inhibitor, right? This bacterium has no capacity to cause disease. This process is called attenuation reversal. So we block this process in the host, and aha, we get the proof of concept that this inhibitor is specifically blocking this process that is enabling the host to fight this particular infection. Okay, second example, Different organism works a little bit differently. Instead of inhibiting inflammation, it evades inflammation. It hides. And so this, this shows two different flavors of, of, of bacteria. And this, this is the work of Dr. Mary Stewart, who's sitting there in the fifth row. Okay, the green bacteria are pro-inflammatory. The red bacteria that aren't expressing this particular pro-inflammatory pro gene that triggers pyrotosis, these are non-inflammatory. Okay. This process, all of these bacterial cells are genetically identical. This is a process known as uh, phenotypic variation. 
It's very important in the clinical lab. It's very important in vivo. Organisms that shift in and out of a uh, growth phase or shift from antibiotic resistant to antibiotic tolerant to antibiotic susceptible. So salmonable, sal excuse me, salmonella is an <coughs> able to affect this change. And what it does is it escapes detection by the pyrototic machinery and that leads to an increase in bacterial replication. And now if we do the experiment where we precisely genetically engineer the bacteria so that now they trigger pyrotosis, we can expect what the answer will be, and that is that bacterial replication leads to inflammation that then leads to the reduction in the ability of these bacteria to grow. And that replication goes down. That tells us that this process is specifically important for replication of these bugs during infection. And then we can ask the genetic experiment, is this process the key process that is actually helping eliminate the bacterium in this situation by genetically altering it so that that host no longer produces pyrotosis, and we get the following answer, which is now these bacteria that were previously unable to cause uh, infection are able to grow. Okay, so this is the proof I, 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 I put forth to examine this concept that there is a relationship between pathogens and the host um, that uh, we can summarize arithmetically. And so the important point is, is that as we modify our ability to combat infection, we modify the capacity of organisms to cause uh, infection. So they're evolving whether we do this or not, but in the context of modern medical therapy, we have impacts here. And this is a dynamic state and we're helping drive the, the net replication of pathogens that maybe have limited capacity to cause infection. However, uh, we are also enabled with powerful tools to look for infection. And an important point for me to pause and make emphasis on is that in microbiology, you only find what you look for. And in microbiology, things you don't look for, you don't see. And things you don't see can kill you. Let's review. You only find what you look for. If you don't look, you can die. Okay? So we have powerful new tools, which also means that the concept of infection is broadening because the replicative niches that are available now to these pathogens are being broadened. And we have new tools to interrogate situations where we have infection to make conclusions about what does it really mean now to be infect, infected and what, it, what truly are the causes of infection. And in the context of making diagnoses, there's another complicating issue, and that is that these host protective responses are not limited to being activated during infection. I, argue with, I would argue with you that all of these responses evolved to deal with infection, but an important complicating issue is the histopathological evidence of inflammation, whether it's caused by infection or by something else, often looks very similar. That's, that point is gonna be important as we go on. So the biological implications of these host defense processes can be summarized here. Many different infections uh, are, are, are combated by pyrotosis, but you probably all remember, I know all of the MLSs do, from their medical bacteriology class, the four cardinal signs of inflammation, right? Ruber, tumor, calor, and dolor. That's right. So many other important processes also um, trigger inflammation through the pyrototic pathway, and that includes heart attack and stroke and cancer, which together with infection are the four leading causes of morbidity and mortality in the developed world. So they all share this propensity to elicit a pathway that causes inflammation, which I would argue with you has evolved to deal with infection. So our first set of learning objectives so that the CMA quiz will be very digestible is that we have an expanding scope of the term pathogen and in terms of its ability to cause infection. 
where net replication in the model that I'm proposing to you determines the outcome of that interaction. And so that the capacity to limit net replication defines the susceptibility of any particular individual. And therefore, frontiers of, of, of infection are expanding. And I will explore that with you with some of the newer molecular diagnostic tools that we are employing in our lab. And I think it's also important to recall as we go forward that the immunological responses evolved to combat these infections are also triggered by other pathological stimuli. Okay, why, why make a diagnosis? Let's go practical. Okay, Google said that diagnosis, the definition is the identification of the nature of an illness. And I completely agree in microbiology. We want to understand, identify the infectious etiologies because we infer their phenotypes. And from that, we can predict the course and potential outcomes of the infection. And that also means we can not only begin very specific therapy, but we can also begin supportive care um, to support those patients. And so the traditional approach that I know you're all familiar with is that we grow things on a plate. And that's beautiful. I love to look at it. It doesn't project as well as it does on my computer. So um, these are the microbes that cause infection. We revisit now that a pathogen is endow endowed with the capacity to cause infection. And that, that's a phenotypic manifestation of the genome. And so we can take a genomic approach to identify these organisms. And it comes with some specific advantages that are particularly useful in a set of cases. So for example, it doesn't, it doesn't require in vitro cultivation. Now, in vitro cultivation is the gold standard of microbiology because we can assess phenotypes. But what's important is we have a difficult time culturing unculturable organisms. And in the best of worlds, fastidious organisms are very challenging to grow because they have exacting requirements. I mean, they beat out the unculturables. Um, but those are overgrown by slowly growing organisms and, and rapidly growing organisms trump all of those. And that is part of the inherent bias of the culturing process is that if we take that plate I just showed you, what's buried in this part of the streak, okay? It turns out we have tools to interrogate that now, okay? Also, the fact that it does not require viability is a distinct advantage, particularly in those situations where the thought of infection was not actually being considered. And so cultures may not have been ordered or in a situation where cultures might have been ordered and they were all negative. We now have an opportunity to interrogate those specimens. And so the general approach is easy. We're looking for variable loci that basically have friendly surrounding conserved sequences that allow us to target genus, species, strain, and attribute specific DNA sequences um, to amplify and sequence. So the platform requirements are when we get a sample in the lab, we want to confirm that DNA has been extracted because otherwise you're not performing a test and to exclude the presence of inhibitors because if you inhibit the reaction that's required to make the diagnosis, it's going to be negative. A positive control to ensure your reagents and instruments are working. A negative control, those are always negative. In our lab, we have outstanding MLSs graduating from our program. They do great work. And then we can use strategies, for example, multiple samples and multi-locus analysis to enhance the accuracy and the sensitivity of the assay because at low concentrations of analyte, uh, one has to deal with Poisson distribution or the inability to capture the analyte in any particular subvolume of the sample that you test. And it's also useful for distinguishing nonspecific or contaminating samples. We are benefited greatly by publicly funded research and the deposition of DNA sequence information into public databases, which provides us a rich source of both fertile information and misinformation, which together with software developers and bioinformaticists, we save only the pearls. Diagnostic yield is proportional to the amount of target in any of the samples, and it's important to appreciate that often tissue samples are non-homogeneous. In other words, their attributes for histopathological evaluation are also uh, hindrance to the 
uniform distribution of a target. So tissues are very different than serum or plasma or blood, although I know my transfusion colleagues consider blood to be a tissue or an organ system. Um, with regard to homogeneity, they're, they're quite distinct. So the foci of infection are often unevenly distributed. And what this means is that sample selection has a huge impact on diagnostic yield. So does sample acquisition. Um, if that sample in, from a patient lands on the floor in the OR, it's now going to have some additional microbial uh, constituents that aren't reflective of what was going on in situ. So the handling is important, as is processing. So if you bathe the sample in unbuffered formalin for two weeks, um, it's going to be very, very challenging for us to do any interrogation of nucleic acid of any variety. So then there's also the, the, the problem of introducing exogenous DNA. Sterile is very different than clean. Clean means there's no DNA, and therefore there are no microbes. Sterile just means they're not going to grow. Their DNA may be present. And just so you know, they're everywhere. So sample characteristics, it would seem then that the presence of form microbial elements would be a diagnostic advantage. I do not dis disagree. But the histopathological evidence of inflammation, based on the context or of the construct of needing net replication to achieve infection, is another great way. It's, a, it's one of the cardinal uh, indicators because that system has lots of feed-forward amplification loops that result in ampl uh, inflammation. You can biopsy a site with radiologic evidence of pathology and then samples that potentially capture distally located targets, i.e., that might appear to be more well-mixed, like bronchioalveolar lavage fluid or cerebral spinal fluid are, are excellent targets. And then, of course, we're also asked to perform our assays on the remaining portion of the precious sample. Who wants a second brain biopsy? Anybody for open lung biopsy times two? Um, could we take another heart valve, please? Uh, I've only got one spleen to give. OK. You see my point. Um, those are circumstances where having uh, the opportunity to query, interrogate, if you will, the specimen for the presence of pathogen is advantageous to the care of the patient. And we're going to show some examples. So genomic approach avoids the bias of culture. Fast growers outgrow slow growers. Slow growers outgrow fastidious growers. And everybody beats the unculturable. Um, maybe some of the members of my family. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> amplification strategies deliver sensitivities in the 0.1 to 100 genome equivalents. So that's in the zip code of subparticle of a, a, a portion of a colony forming unit. That's based on the fact that some of these targets are replicated in the genome. Um, appropriate controls and especially the accessory clinical information supports the best interpretation of the data. When we amplify these polymorphic variable loci that have particular species or genus identifying attributes. And the diagnostic yield is significantly impacted by sample selection, sample handling, and sample processing. If there's one thing I could say again to YouTube land, please understand that how you acquire the sample, how you handle the sample, and how you process the sample probably has the greatest impact on the capability of our diagnostic tools to be effective. OK. Let's go with some cases. This first one is a, is a bit of a bunt. Um, it's a bunt because you can see there's form microbial elements. But it's a young person with leukemia, and it's uh, culture negative. And what would you have for your child? Guess? OK. Well, depending on speciation of Canada, we can make more informed decisions about antimicrobials. It turns out that using broad range fungal PCR, which targets a gene that provides species and genus specific information, we identified Canada albicans. Now, last week while I was reviewing cases, I decided to 
just <laughs> gather some words that I thought I would share with you, and they're all about inflammation. And so you can see on the left-hand side of the screen there, uh, really uh, cellular-based descriptions of inflammatory processes, and then on the right, more tissue-based uh, explanations of uh, inflammatory processes. And in all of these cases, it was interesting because of the rather heroic efforts that they were going to to diagnose cancer. So in the presence of inflammation, uh, they were making uh, a great effort to diagnose cancer. And of course, they wouldn't be sending me the sample if they already had that diagnosis. Um, and the cases I'm about to show you, there, there was no evidence of malignancy. But now in the presence of inflammation, they think exactly what you would think, which is the inflammatory system evolved to deal with infection. So I think this is possibly infection. So I just took a couple of cases from last week that I would share with you. Here they were searching for cancer. These were paraffin embedded formalin fixed samples. They saw inflammation, but in their search for cancer, they also saw fungal elements and we were able to identify the offending agent. In these cases, they were suspicious of cancer. Again, formalin embedded or paraffin embedded formalin fixed tissue. And oddly enough, stains from microorganisms were, were negative in these cases. And so organizing pneumonia, pneumocystis and necrotizing pneumonia, we were also able to diagnose Legionella infection. So this, this shows you then the, the virtues of relying on inf inflammation as an indicator for the possible presence of infection. And since some very good friends of mine happened to be rheumatologically oriented, I had to share these cases, which also happened to come along, where they were considering autoimmune disease and the histopathological description included the description of sarcoidosis or rheumatoid nodules or possible autoimmune disease, and we identified the infecting agents in that case. So I understand the skeptics among you would like more detailed. So how do we know that any of these agents are actually causative of an infection that is legitimate for uh, concern for the patient? And so I thought I would start with uh, and provide you an example of the first case of something. So this 69-year-old man from Ecuador had multiple myeloma treated with chemotherapy and a hematopoietic stem cell transplant. And we received vitreous fluid for the evaluation of bacteria um, using the 16S ribosomal RNA gene as a target and fungi using the 28S ribosomal RNA gene as a target. And what we were able to identify was that the reactions in the fungal PCR provided sequences that were 97% similar with Trypanosoma cruzi, which is a protozoan parasite. And this individual had not been to South America for almost three decades. So needless to say, when we reported this result, there was skepticism at the other end. So a friendly conversation ensued. Here's what I had to say. We confirmed that DNA extraction was well done and there were no inhibitors, obviously, because we got a positive signal and the appropriate controls were working. But we also, we also observed robust amplification in both, both reactions, indicating that the target DNA was uh, uh, abundant in the samples that we analyzed. And there, there's, we'd never detected this before in ocular samples, and there weren't any other samples that day that we were working on that contained T. cruzi DNA either, which reduces the possibility that it could have been an artifact of laboratory contamination. And I went on to say that you know, the 97% similarity to other entries in the NCBI database was very reasonable because the polymorphism at this loci for parasites is, is, is substantially larger than it is for bacteria and fungi. And th this sequence clusters most closely with Trypanosoma cruzi uh, compared to its nearest neighbors, other Trypanosoma species and other protozoan parasites. Um, and, and, and other uh, close relatives like Leishmania. Okay, so due to the similarity of the ribosomal RNA genes, this is not the first time that our fungal primers have detected a different eukaryotic pathogen and some of the others that we have described are listed here. And there are case reports associated with individuals in the audience that I can see right now. So 
the diagnosis was confirmed by two different serological tests and the detection of T. cruzi DNA in the, in the DNA at the blood of the patient. And if you'd like to read more, you can, you can uh, check out this publication. So the genomic approach delivers diagnoses when culture is not possible. Detecting the presence of formed microbial elements is a plus, but it's not a requirement. Where there's fire and pyrotosis, consider infectious causes uh, for that inflammation and appreciate the clinical and histopathological overlap of cancer, autoimmune dysregulation, and infection in terms of making diagnoses. Okay, let's rock and roll through the, the, the last part of the talk here. Um, this is a sequence chromatogram that I'm going to show you from a bloody knee aspirate. And it showed a, a, an interesting organism that's well known to cause otitis media in dogs and dermatitis in dogs and um, could easily be inoculated into a knee with a dog bite. And possibly some of you towards the front are recognizing that there are predominant peaks in this case, but there are also some background peaks. And to make that a little bit clearer, you can see here that there's background peaks. And so there's clearly a predominant signal that can be read here and that identifies Cranibacterium aureus canis, but the sample also has other pathogens present. And so these staphylococcal species are also present, which could be demonstrated by next generation sequencing. And we know they're all there because culture demonstrated that all four organisms were present there as well. So polymicrobial infection is a reality that's not often thought about or th uh, 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 discussed. Um, but it occurs in basically all organ systems and all tissues in the body. And so the real question comes then, if you're using a sequence-based approach, what are you going to do in a situation with a chromatogram like this? Um, who are you going to call? That's not a lead-in for Ghostbusters. Um, it is a lead-in for ability to sequence the genome at 10 to the ninth base pairs per second, which is was used in a cargo bay to reconstruct Worf's, Worf's spine on Star Trek. And we do a lot of sequencing, and we're not up to 10 to the ninth base pairs per second yet. Um, maybe if we lined out all the sequencers up in parallel, we could do that, but probably not. So next generation sequencing, we capture single DNA molecules, not unlike we try to culture single back, a single bacterium into a colony on a plate. We amplify them as clusters and then we sequence them. And this is a flow cell for our Illumina instrument. And this is a quarter. Uh, and this gives you the sense of the size of these chips where we can query hundreds, uh, uh, millions of molecules in a single experiment. And we know that this actually helps us identify organisms that are present in relatively low concentrations. And so I'm going to just share with you some experiments that were completed by uh, Lisa Cummings in our group. And we asked the question, when, when you have organisms present in uh, a complex matrix and you extract their DNA and then you prepare libraries and you sequence, we asked the question, uh, um, is there sequencing biases? And the way we did that was to prepare the libraries independently from each of these organisms and then pool them prior to sequencing. And the answer is the sequencing bias is virtually negligible. Similarly, if we pool after DNA extraction, we can ask if there are PCR biases, and there are, but they're very subtle. Um, and I don't, I don't in, in my opinion, they, they do not substantially impact our ability to to make an interpretation of the sequencing data. Now, when you literally, literally pool the microbes together as intact organisms and then extract the DNA, there is some bias here, and there's bias in DNA extraction. And one of the important points, I think, is that different microbes are susceptible to different uh, abilities to lice. Um, it's not, it doesn't vary by orders of magnitude, but it can make a difference. And I think it's important to appreciate that when you're extracting DNA from organisms that have been growing in situ, inside of the host, right? There are people in this room, right back there, who made his living for several years demonstrating changes in gene expression of bacteria when they're growing in an infectious state 
versus in a test tube. So the ability of the bacterium to modify its ability to cough up its DNA is, is a very real issue, um, but it has a modest impact on our ability to assess uh, or deconvolute polymicrobial infection. Similarly, we can do dilution experiments where we can demonstrate five orders of linear detection. And uh, when a target of interest is diluted into a background of other uh, microbial genomes, and this is important from the standpoint that it allows us to interrogate samples that have additional microbial DNA for the presence of a particular uh, pathogen's DNA. Now, one last thing before I close, also using next generation sequencing, is the ability to sequence whole bacterial genomes and to ask the question about connection in infection control or in epidemiologic investigation. And so here is uh, a representation of a recent case where we have isolates from baby boy, baby girl, and baby boy, all in the same intensive care unit. And this, the strain of infecting organism is uh, essentially the same for each of them. And this happens to be the DNA of the strain isolated from the healthcare worker, okay, that happens to work in the same location with these um, infants. And the good news for the healthcare worker and this organization is that the strain of bacterium from the healthcare worker is readily distinguishable and different than that is found in the patient. The bad news for these patients, of course, is that they're infected and it's likely given the, the virtual identity of the organisms present in all three infants that they are from a common source. So the learning objectives there that in this last section are to appreciate the significance of polymicrobial infection. We don't have a great ability to do that beyond culture. And what I would have you know is that organisms that grow slowly are more difficult to detect in culture. And the rapid growers are the ones that frequently populate our nutrient rich plates. So short of coming up with a very complicated scheme where you have selective media for every single microbe that you would like to grow, so that it excludes the growth of others, the ability to query into that space with next generation sequencing is very powerful. And what I'm here to tell you is that I think this is gonna change our view of infection because I think more infections are polymicrobial than we might have first thought. That also means that NGS is gonna be useful for us in indirect or contaminated specimens. Um, and that ex significantly is gonna extend the repertoire of samples that are amenable to analysis uh, in our lab. And finally, whole genome sequencing is, is a, a wonderful single platform for determining strain relatedness, and that's useful for infection control purposes and also epidemiologic investigations. So uh, I would like to stop there and would be pleased to take any questions. Dr. Hufnagel? Brad, um, how many times is it negative? And do you wish you were trying to detect viruses at the same time when it's negative? Yeah, OK. Um, the first thing I would have you do is recall the impact of sample selection and sample processing, OK? And uh, so it's easy to miss the target if it's not homogeneous and not uh, evenly distributed throughout the target tissue. So uh, the number of negative samples we get varies by location. And so in other words, what I'm telling you is, is exactly what I already said, which is there's a gigantic impact on the ability for us to make a diagnosis based on uh, sample selection and sample handling. So there are sites that have uh, a positivity rate um, on the order of 50%. So 50% of their samples are positive. Um, there are some sites that um, are whiffing at the plate. Um, and so there's everything in between. What about viruses? Okay, oh, thank you. Um, it turns out that I love viruses. Um, viruses 
you know, bacteriophages carry important virulence determinants that are all part of the, my beginning slide. And so it turns out that with capable collaborators on our team that I described in slide number one, um, specifically I'm thinking about Dr. Alex Greninger and Dr. Steve Salaponte, uh, we're working on a metagenomic assay that will allow us to detect viruses at the same time on the same extracted material. Dr. Wenner, my rheumatological colleague. Yes, Brad, very nice talk. Uh, as you uh, noted, of course, pyrotosis and other markers of inflammation are present not only in infection, but in autoimmune and autoinflammatory diseases. Um, are we missing infections in some of these diseases that we call autoimmune or autoinflammatory? And do you think we should look harder? And how would you approach that if you think we should? Well, thank you. That's, that's, that's a great question. And I'm, I'm thinking to myself back in the 1850s, and I'm thinking to myself, I was in London and there were hundreds of people dying of profuse, watery diarrhea. And the hypothesis at the time was that it was caused by miasmas or these toxic vapors. And it turns out that Jon Snow was a very clever guy and he determined that actually that will profuse watery diarrhea that was killing everybody was actually Vibrio cholera. And so I think the possibility, what Dr. Wenner is asking, is that there's an infectious process underlying other disease processes. And I think the answer to that question is an unequivocal yes. Not all of them, but some of them. And the way that we can begin to look is, uh, I think sort of a multi-pronged approach coming from both directions, which is we need to feed samples into the system where we have a suspicion that there may be an infectious etiology. And from the other side, we need to be prepared to apply technology to those particular specimens that we think are gonna be the best for making those queries. And an, an agnostic approach to that is effectively a metagenomic approach where we capture all the nucleic acid and we sequence all of it. And that is, uh, if we extrapolate from the last time I gave, gave grand rounds, um, I, I did do a bit of speculation there about what I thought the future lab was. And uh, I'd like to take a chapter from many administrative people I know and just congratulate myself that, I, uh, that we exceeded my expectations. <laughs> uh, uh, but actually, actually, actually we, we have progressed in that way, and so I, I think there's a, a big world of discovery there in terms of the possibility of infectious agents underlying diseases that we currently don't think are associated with infection. And part of it is many of the cases that I used to illustrate today, we never would have been able to determine that there was an infectious etiology associated with them if we'd relied on the old methods. And so metagenomic sequencing is still a bit of a reach for us um, in terms of its absolute clinical utility. I'm not saying zero. I'm saying it's, it's just less than our current sequencing technology. But the real winner there, Dr. Winner, is going to be in the sample selection. That is really where the money is, just like in the construct that I, 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 I made for saying that there's this coevolutionary dynamic between a pathogen and inhibiting host responses in order to, to cause infection. Dr. Greninger? I was just gonna ask what the Kobayashi Maru is of our Starfleet. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, uh, um, that's a great question. Number one, I, I can't really remember what Kobayashi Maru... Uh, the task. Yeah, the impossible task. Situation. Yeah, so I, I would have said, uh, you know, if I had had that slide um, uh, when I gave my last grand rounds, uh, for sure I would have said it was the informatics. But now, you know, Noah Hoffman and, and, and Steve Salaponte and yourself included, uh, that's no longer an impossibility. And the reason I would think it is an impossibility, because every time you meet with an IT person or bioinformatician, they'll say, anything is possible, Brad. It's just how much do you want to spend? Okay, so that's sort of a, that's, that, that's a large target. I'm sure we could hit that one, um, but it's not a great place to, to, to truly start. Um, now, now the Kobayashi Maru 
uh, uh, say that again? <laughs> Yeah, uh, thank you. The Kobayashi thing, how about that? Uh, is the price of the sequencing reagents is the, the, the biggest, most formidable barrier, I think, now to our progress. Um, that, that's, that's a big barrier. Second barrier is going to be uh, appropriate DNA extraction. That, that's going to be another barrier. But currently, if I'm giving you number one and number two, it's sequencing reagent cost and extraction. Yes, ma'am. Um, can you take it a step further in terms of your sequencing to also predict, say, which um, antibiotics might be, you know, the organism resistant without having to grow and test? Um, the answer to that is yes. And uh, the fidelity with which we can do that varies, both by organism <laughs> and by antibiotic. And that's something that we have just started to work on. Um, because you raise a very important question. Um, it's fine to make phenotypic inferences based on the identity, but the next step that we actually need is to be able to recommend or recommend against a particular therapeutic. So the, the sort of two general flavors of that are to search for known resistance elements in genes and known resistant mutations associated with genes that we know those mutations uh, result in resistance. And then sort of uh, uh, another broader idea that is not mine, it's, it's Steve Salapante's, is to do genome-wide association studies where if we're gathering on a regular basis all the genomic information from all the pathogens in our hospital that we'll be able to make linkage analysis without necessarily being able to target a particular sequence um, uh, we'll have marker sequences to indicate the presence of resistance without actually knowing the genetic basis of that resistance. So that's, that's a second, second idea to, to attack, which I'm, I'm excited about. Dr. Hey, Smith. Hey, how are you doing? Good. Um, how about the application of these technologies to some of the more complex diseases like inflammatory bowel disease or other diseases where dysbiosis and um, changes in, in, in complex flora are really implicated, and there's a growing number of diseases for that. Yeah, thank you. That, that, that's a great question. And I just want to take a, a second to shout out my colleague, Kelly Smith, from the Department of Pathology, because we have published papers together, we have written grants together that have been funded, and we've worked together to train graduate students. All of that, two separate departments. So, <clears throat> uh, now, back to your question, which is more complex diseases, and I th my answer is yes and more yes. So the first, the first version of yes is that the, we certainly have the capacity to analyze those samples, and currently what we're working on in that regard, Kelly, is to make clinically relevant classifications. And so some of the most talented people on the team are applying their efforts to that every day because operational taxonomic unit doesn't really have a lot of medical significance to me or to you. And so I think there's going to be two flavors. There's going to be a diagnostic tool that provides you with information where the sequence information directly tells you about the disease process itself. In other words, dysbiosis is a cause of a particular disease. And then there's the biomarker hypothesis, which I am certain that this is going to work because uh, we are going to be able to query the microbiome or the metabiome, and it will be a marker for some particular, much like we, we might use genome-wide associate or uh, GWAS studies to uh, make connections with antimicrobial resistance that on a population level, those might also be biomarkers for disease or disease susceptibility or suitability for treatment plan. And uh, if, if, if I were gonna do my grand speculation slide, which, no, I had some additional slides, but you guys have asked great questions. I would say that the biomarker one is gonna work for sure. We're, we're gonna find associations with uh, um, different signatures that are gonna be useful for us in stratifying patients for treatment and diagnosis. The connection to the, di uh, to the actual diagnosis um, I think that's going to be more challenging, but uh, we will have the tools available to approach that, that question. I just think the biomarker part will come first. 